Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode 28. I'm Mark. Here with me today is Orion. Hey, what's up? Matt. Actually, I'm Dan. <laughs> no. Dan, you're, you're, you're a secret no, twin. No, I'm Matt. <laughs> and then another Matt that we call Bubba instead, all the way from Connecticut. I thought, I thought you were Dave. Dave, is it Dave? Was it Dave? Was Dave? I forget. So we're talking about, well, Mark, congratulations on a year of The also, Thoughtful Gamer. Also, congratulations on being on the podcast. <laughs> Wait, me? Yeah, you didn't introduce yourself, did you? I did. I oh, remembered okay. this time. Oh, yeah. I All said, right. I'm Mark. Oh, there you go. People, Welcome to The people... Thoughtful Gamer podcast, Mark. Well, thanks um, for thank you. Us. I'm but glad for being here. Congratulations be here. on a year of The Thoughtful Hasn't Gamer. Hasn't he done this, this often is... enough that everybody yeah. should know that this is Mark? Sure. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> He, well, why was that such a I don't know. long silence? <laughs> Who knows? I don't know in what order people listen to podcasts. Like, if someone discovers the podcast, do they go the most recent one or they start at the beginning? I go to the most recent one. If it's excellent, I go back to the beginning. See, That's true. What I would do probably if I listened to podcasts, which I don't very often, is I if I heard about a particular episode, I'd listen to that episode. If not, I'd scroll through and find a topic that I liked, yes. listen to that and then start at the beginning if I loved it. Yeah. So who knows what everyone's introduction to the Thoughtful Gamer will be. Anyways, yeah. my name's Mark. Yeah, anyway, I was I was saying after a year this is the first time I've been on the podcast after your year anniversary. You did an AMA on Reddit. It was cool. I thought it was successful. Someone pointed out that apparently I sound like Dave who lives in Boston, who's your secret brother you haven't told us about. Yeah. Is he a twin? I forget. <laughs> Someone else also pointed out, I think you, they said you sound like Kriparian from uh, Hearthstone streams, which I don't get. I, I, I listened to him again, and I don't think it sounds like you, but he's a guy. He, he plays Hearthstone. He's yeah. really grumpy. That's all I know about him. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I've seen a clip of his stream, he's just sitting there like he hates his life, and but he's making just loads of cash playing Hearthstone, so he can't really stop. <laughs> and that seems to I be his he, MO. I think he got his like fame from playing some other MMO I think it was game. WoW. Uh, he, yeah, I looked up his stream and he had a bunch of different games on there. Oh, is he doing uh, different games now? On YouTube, he had a bunch of different videos. Oh, okay. I don't know what his main thing is. Yeah, I don't know. His main thing is Hearthstone. I think that's where he got most famous. But everything I've seen of him, he hates Hearthstone. <laughs> It's just making him a millionaire, so... I mean, I'd do the same thing, probably. Anyway, this is a podcast about board games, and we're going to talk about how to not suck at board games. So we're going to go over some general strategies of when you're approaching a new game or you're trying to get better at a game, what are the things you should think about in terms of strategic decision-making or just how to kind of frame your thoughts going into that game. And I'm going to throw it over to Matt... Not Bubba Matt in Connecticut, but Matt slash Dave slash the secret twin of... Anyway, who had some thoughts that I didn't actually see because he didn't put it on our shared folder or our shared document, but rather his own private document. Well, okay. So first of all, <laughs> let's let's talk shop here. Let me tell you how the sausage gets made just a little bit. Mark asks us, what thoughts did you prepare? And then I tell Mark that I didn't really prepare anything except this one thing, and then I describe it. Mark misinterprets what I say and then says, that'll be a great first thing to put on the podcast. You said it was general <laughs> framework-style thoughts. All I right. just don't know what they are. Okay, so... Um, okay, what were you thinking? Yeah, so let me give... I was trying to, to consider what is my framework when I play a new game for the first time. What is it that I, I generally look for to to help me make decisions. And the thing that came to mind was looking for bottlenecks. So looking for bottlenecks in what are the the, the different parts of the game. I, and I want to say like the resources in the game, but that's too specific. Just like the, the different parts of the game, the different bits of the game, whether they be resources, if it's a Euro, or even like actions or action points i guess would be if it's a game where you have a limited number of things you can do just figuring out what are the things that are going to most limit you 
and then work from that to if you can optimize that that bottleneck then you can kind of work out and, and formulate a plan from there Okay, so, so you mean like what is the most scarce thing? Yeah, what is the most scarce thing? In, in, in some games, it's going to be a resource. And mm-hmm. you're like, well, clearly I need iron to make my mechs or something. And that is really hard to get. And so I'm going to frame my strategy around getting that. Sometimes it's not something like that. Sometimes it's I can only do one thing per turn. And I, I really have to focus on optimizing the 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 only thing i can do because i'm i'm limited in the number of things that i can do i mean fundamentally to most games it's going to be the action is the limiting factor it it varies or in all games pretty much yeah i think it varies though because cuz sometimes there's no choice to be made some games like you're always going to be doing the same thing every turn i don't i don't think this is worth pushing too much just when I, I go into I, the... I think it is though cuz actually I feel like I think exactly opposite that which is very interesting. So like I'm going to bring up Settlers of Catan cuz I feel like that should it's be a, a global a enough game. game. That, um it's a thoughtful game and we like should you, talk about more. And you look at Settlers and when you first approach the game you see that there's five things you can build, right? You got your your road, your settlement, your city, your development card. What am I missing? Maybe I'm not missing anything. Maybe it's just the four things. And the first thing that pops out to you is, hey, sheep are just trash, right? And and like we all know this now because we've played this game enough. But I I remember when I first played this game that I was like, hey, that sheep two-for-one port is going to be far more valuable than any other port because we're just going to have lots of sheep. Compared to, and like I would also look at, hey, all the eights and sixes are on wood. This game, wood's going to be in abundance. And I'm not necessarily looking at scarcity. I'm looking at what is the resource or the thing that we're going to get the most of? And how can I best utilize that? Is it, hey, I'm just going to build a butt ton of roads because wood's all over the place? Or is it, should I go hard after this wood two for one port because wood's all over the place? Um, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, it, it, I mean, like I said, I, I'm i throwing out kind of a, a really abstract framework. What I think you're talking about is simply action efficiency, that you want to get the most things out of the least yeah. amount of effort. So you identify so what I think, thing... I think what I'm trying to, to give is something almost less nuanced than that. It's just... When you sit down at the table, you figure out what the rules are, and then you figure out something that you're going to run out of first, whether that's movement or action or a thing, and then you can work from there to, to overcome the limitations. And, and, and naturally, that's going to flow into building some sort of engine. Yeah, and then some games kind of give that to you more explicitly, like in Agricola, when you're talking sure. about food. Yeah. And and this is this is what I would apply to, like a software problem, of like if professionally I I I might look at a system that has a performance issue and you just look for bottlenecks. I I think that that the, I don't know the idea of bottleneck is a way of solving a problem in a very general way. You tackle the thing that is the limiting factor. Yeah, that makes sense. I had a couple of general ideas that I wrote down. The first one, and this applies to effectively Euro games, is that you need to understand the relative values of your different currencies and resources in the game. Because all, all Euro games are going to have some kind of resource exchange. Ultimately, that's going to be converted into victory points of some kind. You know, for, for games that have victory points. So... What I always look for when I first sit down to a brand new game is what did the designer value? So, or rather, what kind of prices did the designer put on everything? And sometimes it's very explicit. So in Tzolkin, you have an action where you can exchange various resources for other resources and and currency, which is corn. And there's a very specific exchange rate. And so that printed right on the board 
is a general idea of the value of the different things, and even more so because you can actually exchange them at that rate in the game. So understanding what the value of something is can help you frame your decisions and kind of price your actions so you can kind of easily get metrics for okay, doing this action will give me X amount of resources generally once you can kind of combine everything into a single value. The other example that I had was in Seven Wonders where my play got a lot better once I forced myself to always remember that money has a three to one exchange rate with victory points because you at the end of the game, you get a victory point for each gold you have. And then I realized, oh, money is a lot more flexible because it can help you build your engine. It can help you purchase things. So in actuality, uh, three money is worth more than a victory point. So you're basically valuing liquidity. Right. In that sense, you're valuing the, the flexibility that it gives you. But it helps me. It helped me to understand and kind of price different actions to be like, okay, this is giving me nine money which is in this other cards, give me three victory points. I'll take the one that gives me nine money because at the end of the game, it's worth the same, but the money has more flexibility and more options attached to it. Similarly, again, like to Zulkin, you know, I might go for a play that gives me a certain amount of resources, knowing that at some point I can probably exchange them. But then obviously you have to factor in the cost of the play to get to the exchange action or whatever. But understanding how you should value everything in the game is, is kind of fundamental to getting a good grasp of what you should value in the game. There's also some games that put values on certain actions or like I'm thinking magic, for example, has a cost to every card you play, like a mana cost, right? Or, or hearthstone They they all have. So each, each ability costs you say five mana and theoretically, every card that costs five mana should have a relatively equal power level. However, that obviously, we all know that that's not the case. There's better five mana cards than some others. Yeah, and, and, and that's it's partially to built note- in. That's pr- from, for the specific example of Magic, that's built into kind of the model of the game in which they... Correct. They make certain cards look slightly more powerful, but also more rare. Well, and like any kind of worker placement or Euro game that requires you to take an action, or there's some games where you have more than one action, each of those actions acts similar to like a mana in Magic, where you're paying a certain cost to do something, and those somethings should theoretically be of the same value, but aren't necessarily always, that's not always the case. So you have to evaluate that within each game that you play. Right. And so if you can find the things that are above the curve, you're going to be more efficient and more powerful uh, in your plays. Right. And then looking at at Euro games where they're, you know, a, a good one will be roughly equally balanced where a given play will, without context, have roughly the same amount of value as a different play. Once you understand that, you, you you have to start understanding the contextual things that make certain moves better than others. So usually either the actions of other players would be the main one, and then maybe if there's some randomizing elements in the game. So in other words, in any worker placement game, most of the spots are going to have in the abstract about the same value, but in the context of the game... You have to understand when those values change because of how the other players are playing. And also what you need at the time. Yes, yeah. that too, yeah. Yeah, I, well, um, we just played Stop Thief, the, one of the new restoration games. So in, in Stop Thief, on your turn, you're going to play one of your like six movement cards that has a different number on it. And moving more is strictly better, but like you have to play your lowest movement card in order to pick up your other cards so in that case like you have an action that is strictly worse than all the other actions but depending on where you are in how many cards you have left in your hand the value increases yeah yeah no that makes perfect sense and you'll also see it in a lot of worker placement games where there will be the kind of emergency action 
where like if you if you're stuck and you have literally nothing else to do, you can go to this thing and get like a money. And so if there's a game with that with that kind of action spot, you can use that as a frame of reference of okay, my goal is to not have to go there. And I yeah. and, and you you're achieving some level of efficiency and success if you can plan around not going to like the fishing spot in Agricola or the one money spot in Viticulture or something like that. I'm going to jump in with kind of what I thought about the way I approach games in that, and I'm going to use Lisboa as an example because it's fairly complex and it's something we've played recently. But in games like that, I tend to try to understand the different like action loops that you're doing because most of these Euros, you're trying to accumulate victory points of some kind. And there are multiple paths to doing that. But usually there's kind of a process to that. So, for example, in Lisboa, you need to first get money and then you can build stores and then you can construct a public building. Or then you need workers and then you can build a public building, which actually scores points for you. So I try to approach and think about the order of things I'll need to do to get to a goal. So I'll have a goal of, all right, I want to build a public building, which will give me points. To do that, I need this, and then to do that, I need this, and to do that, I need this. So I try to kind of construct an order of operations, which almost certainly goes back to my mental training as a programmer of, you know, this line of code happens, then this line of code, then this line of code, and logically that creates the outcome that I'm going for. And Scythe is an interesting example for this because it has that built-in fundamentally into the player boards right? where you can just say, okay, your goal is to get to bottom level actions as fast as possible. And that's kind of the same thing as you would see in a more nebulous form in games like Lisboa, where you're trying to get to the point where you have a more efficient turn where you're accomplishing more than one thing at a time through, like you said, smart ordering of actions. In Scythe, it's a little bit more explicit which I think could be helpful maybe for some people. Scythe is actually a great case study because um, the other thing Scythe has, it it has that built-in turn cycling that I haven't played at Lisboa yet. But, um, in that you can't do the same thing twice in a row. You can't do the same thing twice in a row and it has these kind of two to four turn loops of efficiency, I think. Right. Where you're kind of collecting resources, expanding and building things. And each player board is slightly different in how the actions line up to do that. But it, you end up having these loops and then you're trying to squeeze as much efficiency out of those loops. And, you know, maybe you make a detour on your standard loop, but you're trying to be as efficient as possible in doing so. Yeah. 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 I think it, another good example of this is viticulture in that you have to per- first plant vines and then harvest them and then make sure. wine and then sell the wine. So so there you have a, a very obvious pipeline. Yeah. And then all the decisions you make are kind of around this pipeline. So you, you so, have like the critical path of four or five actions yeah. to get to selling a wine order. But then you can also get visitor cards to bypass certain of those or try to squeeze out extra efficiency by, you know, coming at it from a different angle. Yeah. Now, in using the language of pipeline, I'm getting back to you know, my concept of bottleneck. Right. And, and, and that's, if I were to come at viticulture, that's what I'm looking at. Like, I, I realize, like, I have to have fields, or I guess you start with fields. I don't know. You, ha- you have to have vines. You have to have vines, yeah. In order to produce any quantity of wine. So that's my first bottleneck. Um, and the thing is... Everyone else has the same... In that game, everyone has the same bottleneck. Right. And so turn order matters a lot in that if you go early, you can grab the vines. And if you go late, you get a better bonus, but you have to go do something else first. Yeah. And then you na- naturally start valuing turn order very highly. And approaching a new game for the first time, that's kind of the mental process I would go through is identify something that I know that I have to do in order to do other things. So plant vines in order to do anything with wine. Mm -hmm. And then very quickly, you can kind of work towards a strategy of like understanding that turn order is important. I think we're we're saying similar things, but just kind of, oh yeah, we're we're viewing it a little differently. I mean, I'm trying to kind of 
figure out a loop and plan to be efficient in executing that loop. Yeah. And you're figuring out what's the most scarce thing that I have to do and then making sure you can do that and build it. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's interesting to compare the two thoughts. Mine is simpler. Like mine is, <laughs> mine is like identify one thing. Yours is more complete. Identify the kind of looping process of the game and then manipulate yeah. that. Mine is more figure out the order of things I need to do. Yeah. And then try to set myself up to do that efficiently and set myself up to do the next thing. So every turn I'm trying to set myself up for the next action. Yeah. That's, that's super it, interesting because I think I view it a bit more from Orion's perspective. But it's very clear on games like Viticulture what the natural pathway is to getting your victory points. In a game like Terra Mystica, it can be a lot less clear because each of the different factions will have different strengths and weaknesses. And then in that game, most importantly, the the bonus point tiles can determine a lot of when you want to build certain buildings and certain rounds. But in that case, you're just trying to, I guess, more tactically adapt to the variable setup to try to create those efficiency loops or try to, to pinpoint where, yeah. where you're going to... F- come up short in a certain resource or where you might get stuck on on a certain building progression well in a game like terra mystica less so but still definitely so in scythe you are concerned with your own efficiency loop because you have unique characteristics compared to the other players and then you have to you know you're considering the shared board and what other people want to do but in those games you're more focused on your own efficiency loop your own bottlenecks. Yeah. Or even a game like Harvest, where you have a lot of right. really asymmetric where, where each, starting positions. Yeah, each farmer has an incredibly different uh, strength that, that leads to different gameplay. Whereas a game like Viticulture, you're all doing the same thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, once you get into the game and, and, you know. But even more specifically, like Concordia, where you're really all doing the same thing. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. I think it's interesting. We have the, Orion, you've got this kind of Figuring out a cycle. I'm looking for the bottlenecks. So what's the purpose of this podcast? As we're talking about these things, are they useful at, for, you know, for people to go into a new game? And like, does this help them hone their strategy? Does this give them something to like, like is this just like a first thought that they, they can go in and figure out what to grab onto in order to figure out what else to do? Yes. To both. Like, I think this kind of information is helpful to people entering a game for the first time and also people trying to get better at games they maybe regularly play. I think if you were to say, okay, this is like high level advice, it would need to be specific to the game. But before that, there's a lot of general principles based on common design features that we see in many games. So, for instance, in Euro games, they're all about resource valuations. So trying to figure out how the designer value different resources and then trying to filter that in through the context of the game is a great way to look at any kind of Euro. Yeah. What I'm surprised we haven't actually mentioned yet is back to like one of our first podcasts uh, with Foo and the first order optional. I don't remember first what the order heck. optimal strategy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Foo's but fine. that's like the baseline of every game. Like when you look, I, I think we mentioned it for Dominion specifically, but it's true of every game. Almost every game has this very baseline strategy that you should be able to recognize as soon as you pick up the game. And one of one of the big things about being good at a game is realizing what that strategy is and then understanding uh, how to both manipulate it and how to better it. Like, how, how do you beat this strategy in any given game? Yeah, that's a really good point. Although I would argue with the idea that a foo strategy exists in every game. I, I don't think it does. I think it's actually probably a minority of games where there's a clear foo strategy because part of it being a foo strategy is that it has to be pretty readily apparent to new players. The idea is that it's like, so I agree with you, but I do think that most games have at least a hint of it. 
So, for example, Twilight sure. Struggle yeah. does not – you would argue that that does not have a foo strategy, right? Probably not, no. All right. But, like, I do think that it's pretty well received that one of the best first turn actions is to go and coup Iraq, right? Iran. 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 Thank you. And I think, like, something like that, while part of that is just meta in that game – I do think that it's well received enough and this exists in other games too where there's just this action that is either better in some ways than most others or yeah so is the most obvious and yeah so that makes you sense you need if... to evaluate that and find out or figure out to yourself how do I beat this or how do I be creative around that is a similar concept just kind of like a the first action so like in concordia you have kind of the idea of expanding to another city and settling it in the first turn is is, is yeah is that the same thing that you're getting at bubba i i wouldn't say that's necessarily a foo strategy because it's not a strategy it's an, it's an action it's like a basic heuristic it's not even a heuristic the idea of a foo strategy is that it's a repeatable thing so it's actually a strategy for the game. So obviously right, Dominion, right? Big, I was big comparing money more to what Bubba was talking about. Sure, which isn't a food strategy. I was no, that's not because it's not a strategy. It's it's a it's an opening move or it's a you know it it's along the same line. Sure, I think when you one thing you could say is what is the most obvious way of scoring victory points in a game? Sure, yeah. Like in Viticulture, it's fulfilling wine orders but after you play it once or twice you're like hey i can totally get a bunch of blue cards and trickle this way and fill like one order and still win yeah well and again this is going a little off point and being a little bit pedantic but a food strategy also doesn't necessarily have to be retract what i said earlier a food strategy doesn't have to be an obvious strategy it's a very easy to execute repeatable strategy so I believe the concept came into being in the context of fighting video games where sure. you could master like a particular character's like punch and then, you know, players at a medium to low level in that game could have would have a very hard time with you just spamming that one punch or kick. But a yeah. high level player would be able to easily defeat it because they know how to counter it. That's kind of the epitome of a foo strategy, but doesn't necessarily mean that's necessarily the first thing they're going to come up yeah, with can, can we briefly throw out some food strategies in splendor of just trying to buy the cheapest card whenever possible that would be a food strategy until you pivot to like get nobles or whatever i think it's i think bubba has a good point though of trying to recognize kind of the obvious path or kind of the path maybe the designer was pushing new players towards and then using that as a baseline to try to one up it at yeah. any point. Yeah, I that's think that's really, a great idea. And, it, and that's interesting because some games are really played on the margins and you're never going to veer that far from kind of the main path. I would argue that that's most games. Probably. Honestly. Yeah, probably. Most Euro games, yeah. E even big complex Euros, yeah, you're not veering War that games far. too. Like war games are all on margins. Uh-huh. Right. It's interesting when you find a game where there's that like alternate strategy where it's very clear that you found a way to subvert the first order strategy. With alternate strategies, they wouldn't be alternate unless uh, they were worse. So I guess what I'm trying to get at is if in Viticulture where, when you can uh, go the blue cards. So if you went the blue cards every game, right? and you ended up just winning all the time, then all of a sudden just going the blue cards would be the optimal strategy and everyone would do it. And it would no longer be the uh, the secondary or basically like subversive strategy. So um, I, I don't that... agree with that. I mean, in the context of a particular game group's meta, maybe, but there's still in Viticulture, in the context of learning the game, it's very obvious that the game, just by its design, is kind of saying, hey, you should make some wine and sell it for wine orders. Just because those are the options that exist and those are the most direct ways, that's the most direct route to victory points 
when you don't know much about the randomized elements. Yeah, no, you're right. That's true. But and I guess I guess what more what I'm saying is it would make for bad game design if all the blue cards in Viticulture say gave 20 points a piece and just were heads and shoulders above making wine. Yes. Yeah, so, right? so you said they wouldn't be alternate strategies if they weren't worse. So what you're saying is that that kind of subversive alternate strategy is something that only works when you can. I think it requires two things. Okay. It requires creativity. So doing these alternate strategies while also doing this main strategy, your main goal. So like if if you can get a blue card that allows you to produce wine faster while also giving you victory points for the end game is is a good way of doing this, right? Because you're doing you're accomplishing two things at once. I it mean, requires <laughs> creativity, but it also requires like a, a meta choice so that you can do something different to subvert it. Because a lot of the games have kind of a rock, paper, scissors element where yeah. this strategy is good. Yeah. And then this one is better than it in this way, but so, it's harder to execute. Yeah, and I think... Sure. I think I, I think I said this earlier. You start with a first order strategy or an obvious strategy, and then you're trying to find ways to subvert it or or work around the margins to Im- improve your place from that kind of baseline. And sometimes that is taking advantage of... So I think what we've been talking about with the blue card strategy is getting ahead compared to other people because maybe you're the only person doing it. Yeah, um, that's that's a little farther on my list. I think it depends on the game. Sure. Some games are just always going to be much more tactical and reactive. Yeah, so, so, but I think what happens in games that where you can pursue multiple different broad level strategies is you have sort of a Hegelian dialectic going on in the meta where you have the obvious strategy to get points and that does well. And then someone finds an alternative radical strategy and then all of a sudden maybe that strategy is beating the dominant strategy. And then somewhere in the middle there's a, there's a strategy that beats it that, that takes into consideration not just kind of repeating a strategic heuristic but taking into account contextual factors Right. And, and the play of other players. So, and usually I think great games, the best play is somewhere in that middle ground where it's really, really on the margin, but everyone's aware of kind of the strategic boundaries are. So in order to make this somewhat practical, like the, the idea we're getting at is it's good to have kind of that baseline strategy in mind. And then you're judging your other possibilities in relation to that. Whether, oh, yeah. whether yeah. they be small, kind of on the margins improvements, or they be bigger deviations in strategy, you're judging them against what your kind of baseline strategy. So if you're playing and you, you can't figure out what the baseline is, you're going to be aimless. Yeah, sure. But you got to get pretty into pretty heavy games until... You find games where it's not fairly obvious what a decent strategy is. Oh, sure, is. sure, sure. Yeah. Well, let's move to my second point, because I think this is one that's really interesting and one that I've had to learn over and over with games, is that is always be aware of how much time is left in the game. So a lot of these games will have a built-in timer mechanism where you can see either you know there are three rounds left or... In the, the example I thought of was the decks in Through the Ages, where once you get to age three, you can see how big that deck is, and you can estimate how many rounds are left. Because with a lot of the Euro games in particular, they're they're ultimately engine building games yeah. where you're trying to gain like passive income, either in resources or victory points or whatever. And maybe they'll have some options to gain resources or victory points immediately and i find that people tend to overestimate how much time is left yeah. and therefore value the passive income options more frequently than they ought they're overestimating how much time is left i think the more common problem is just overvaluing the engine compared to where it's taking you 
yeah, yeah. basically so the same I, I thing. Think, yeah. I think that's the biggest mistake people make. Uh, and this is one of the points I had written down is you, you have to think of your engine as almost like a graph. And <laughs> this is coming from me and my mathematical mind, but your victory points are almost like if, if your engine is a line graph, your victory points are the area under that line graph. So like the integral of that line. You want your engine to spike before the game ends, not as the game is ending, because ideally the most area will be like you've already spiked before the game ends and you're already on your downward. My engine is getting less efficient, not all the way inefficient, obviously, because if your engine was getting more efficient, you would want to keep playing because correct, correct. Presumably you're getting farther ahead. Right. Yeah. That's really hard. When I play a game, I just want to make my engine more and more efficient. Maybe this is a difference of like... Well, I think that's just really fun to do. It's really fun, yeah. But like, I think you said you have to, you've to. you had to relearn this over and over again. I think oh, yeah. I have too. Because like, it's just really fun to make your engine as, as great as possible. And, you know, according to what the formulation that Bubba has laid out here, the most efficient engine will never win. Because the most efficient engine should have been curtailed earlier. Not exactly my point. But usually no, usually the most at it from the, the other, engine the other that is the engine that is currently the most efficient as the game ends will not usually win. You want the engine that became efficient like two turns before the game ended. Well, it's because, also yeah. it's also important important to point out that when you have an engine build a game, frequently there's a point where you have to pivot your engine from generating secondary resources to generating primary resources, which, i.e., victory points. Yeah. Right. So that's so the, super important to take into consideration the as well. Classic example of Dominion: you can keep buying gold, which feels awesome, but eventually you have to buy those provinces. Right. And then a lot of games, again, will have that built in where, they'll ha- yeah. where they will have like end game things and they're yeah. usually super expensive. So you kind of have built into the game a goal. OK, I want to get my, my resource generation Sometimes big enough really where obvious. I can buy that thing at the end. Yeah. Right. Tzolkin has that. Above, above and below above has below, that. Yeah. Those are the two that come to mind immediately. Through the ages, there'll be a wonder at the end you tr- usually try to build. But... Sometimes. Through the ages... It, it depends a lot. Through the Ages is an odd one, but but it very clearly has a timer in so, a stack of cards. So how does this point apply to non-Euro games, like a war game or um, um, uh, paying attention to how much time is left? I mean, certain war games that we have at least will have a timer. So like Triumph and Tragedy, you have a certain number of rounds that you play out. I think it applies less to war games because usually the victory in a game where the victory condition, like in memoir 44 is just killing a certain number of things. It doesn't really apply. Right. So I I think it applies in the fact that most other games that don't have a timer, the timer is actually, Hey, another player just won. So like settlers is, is a Euro game, but that game doesn't really have a timer. It's, a person reached 10 victory points, they won. So in that case, you don't want your engine to peak before the game ends. You want it to still, you want it to be going off to infinity so that you just want to hit that 10 points as fast as humanly possible. Well, in that case, your your victory points are roughly a measure of your engine's efficiency. I think in war games, it's usually, I mean, obviously they're more combative, so it's much more about what can your opponent do to you and what can you do to them? But the maybe the more analogous point is managing your hand of cards in, a, you know, like Twilight Struggle of I want to coup this and I need to put influence here and I need to play this scoring card and I want a little flexibility to deal with whatever my opponent does so I don't have influence to go into South America or something like that. Or in Here I Stand, something that we've run into is forgetting that you have to siege a fort and not giving yourself enough time to get your armies out all the way out there and have a round to siege it because you have to go back to your fortified locations in the winter, you know, for winter quarters. And so you can end up wasting a lot of actions if you don't capitalize on that whole campaign. 
Um, or in um, the coin games, knowing about how much longer until the next winter phase. That's very important, yeah. But I I think it mostly applies in engine building games where I think people tend to get caught up in building a cool engine and don't pivot soon enough. And by pivot, I mean you like change your time preference from long-term gain to short-term gain just because a lot of these games try to end the game right you know, while it's still really heating up, they don't allow kind of a longer decline, I guess, in engines or something like that. They tend to end, and we've talked about this before, sometimes we feel a little bit too quickly. And so that just means a lot of the times when I'm looking back on my play, I think, okay, I just need to kind of trigger the engine to turn towards victory points sooner. You just, you have to recognize that point when you stop building the engine and start getting the cashing in cashing out yeah and and when does like a five point immediate play when is that better than investing in a one point per turn building or something yeah and and one thing that's in that i've found a couple times when i'm i look through kind of the strategy forums on board game geek is when people kind of break it down and say okay the average length of this game is 15 rounds and sometimes in my in the back of my head, I'm thinking that it's about 25 rounds or something. Like I, I always overestimate how many rounds a game is. Yeah. And then it really puts in a perspective, oh, wow, I only do 15 things the whole game. I think, at least for me, I always think the game has more actions than it does. We talked about this in reference to mines in Castles of Burgundy. And we said that in terms of resources, they only pay off if you get them in like round one or maybe two. Well, that's an interesting one because when I was writing the strategy guide for Castles of Burgundy, I had this in mind and that was my assumption going in. But when I did the math, actually mines are pretty valuable all game, almost all game. Is that because they finish sections? Yes. Okay. Right. That That's the balancing fact. In, I'm just saying in terms of oh, resource yeah, yeah. income... They're only really worth it in the first round, and I think they break even in round two or yes. something like that. Yeah, in terms of getting your actions back. Right, because you spend, you know, two actions to get it or something. Yeah, but, but in that case, it's different because you have to think of opportunity costs where others... Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway, understanding how much time is left in the game, I think, is really important. In, in my perspective, when you get towards the end of the game, I'm trying to think which loops can I fit in before the end of the game. You know, how many actions left do I have? Well, I have to cut that. I have to cut that. All right, this is my path now for the rest of the yeah, game. Yeah, and a lot of the time, it's it's really hard to kind of cut out plans that you're making. Like you get, for, for me at least, I get really attached to them. Yeah. And sometimes I'm just, I, I think I can do it. And it's like, oh, I was a round short on, on doing anything with that whole like three turn plan. Yeah, yeah. The third thing I wrote down, and this is coming from Netrunner because it, it it seems so obvious when you hear it, but it, it still kind of blew my mind a bit that I felt kind of dumb that I didn't think of it. But the idea is that you always draw first. So what that means is in a game like Netrunner or Magic, you want to get the random element over with first and then make your other decisions in the context of that already happening. So, in a game like Netrunner, if you're planning out your turn and you want to draw a card, you should almost always do that first. There are other things that can, you know, change that decision process. Just because the card you draw may present you with a better turn than you had before. Right. You want as much information up front as you can to make the best decision that you can. Yeah. And, and the, the other games I thought that really have this obvious, uh, obviously is Above and Below and Near and Far, where you have the exploring action. And there's a lot more considerations there in terms of like worker placement blocking and stuff. But all else being equal, you kind of, you always want to do those exploration things first because they have random, semi-random rewards coming out of them. And then you can frame your other decisions in the context of knowing what those rewards are. And I think it's just a really, really helpful piece of advice that you you do the random part first so you have more information before you make other decisions. You know what we should talk about <laughs> is uh, baseball opening day. Yeah, and, uh, that's today. Yeah. It's it's March 29th. You know who's ready for opening day? Sydney Not the Crosby, Cardinals. They lost. Just bunted a puck <laughs> in the net. 
to win against New Jersey in overtime. Wow. Possibly the goal of the year. Did you just bring up baseball in order to bring up <laughs> hockey? <laughs> Do you like that switcheroo? No. No. Because <laughs> baseball nope. is superior to hockey. <laughs> anyway, back to board games. Uh, the fourth thing I wrote down, and this is, again, a concept that seems really obvious, but I frequently find myself not thinking about it until partly through the game, and that is the idea of deck efficiency. So any game in which you have a deck of cards, maybe it's a deck builder, maybe it's a CCG, maybe it's a Euro where you have a deck of cards. Uh, we were just playing Mombasa, and this would apply to Mombasa somewhat. And that's the idea that your deck is as valuable as the average card value in the deck, not the best cards in your deck. Because you're going to be drawing all the cards at some point, unless there's something weird about how they do the, the card draw. But okay. you always want to be increasing the average value of your deck. And can, sometimes that means getting rid of bad cards instead of gaining better cards. Can you reformulate that in a more general way that, than just decks? No, this is specific to decks. Is it? I think so. Maybe it is. Right? It, any, in any game in which you are forced to go through your deck, you want your deck to be on average. You want each hand to be as good on average as I guess, possible. I don't know. Maybe I'm thinking like removing negative effects is perhaps as useful as, as gaining positive. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay. yeah that it, could apply. It's definitely, it's definitely most obvious in a deck building situation. Yeah. And that's yeah. why, you know, people who play a lot of deck building games understand that trashing a card, getting a card out of your deck is really powerful because not only does it increase the average strength of your, of your deck, but allows you to get through the deck more frequently. And so you get access to better cards more frequently. This is one that I struggle with on new games because I don't have a good mental model of how valuable getting rid of a card is. It's much easier to see, oh, if I buy that that new shiny great card, it I, clearly that improves my deck. But in a new game, it's harder for me to kind of measure how much better my deck is improving by trashing things. So this isn't, I don't think this is revolutionary, but one thing that helps me deal with that is to just think about how many times I'm going to see that great card. And maybe as a result, my tendency is usually, so what's the game we played the other night that was great? Time of Crisis. Oh, yeah. That was yeah. really fun. That's the first time I played it. And I got a good economy going in that game. I was able to buy a couple really good cards early. But then very quickly, I had this deck of about 15 cards drawing five cards a turn. So it was obvious to me that if I bought another card, that was probably immediately going to, to roughly reduce the number of times I see that other really good turn, the other really good card by one. Well, I mean, I think that's the product of you playing Dominion over yeah, a thousand yeah, yeah. times, probably by this point. Okay, so but, so just to break it down into something that's actually useful to think about, maybe for people who haven't played Dominion a million times, if you can consider that adding another card to your deck means that you see that other awesome card one fewer time you're going to value getting rid of a crappy card a lot more. Yeah, yeah, that's a great way to put it, I think. Yeah, I think I've just learned by experience that trashing my coppers and estates is always, almost always the right play in Dominion just because I've played it hundreds of times. But in other games, I just have a hard time evaluating. Yeah. As we action. sit here now and think about it, mathing it out seems really reasonable to me. Uh, yeah. Even Even Dominion, like, I think... One of those baseline strategies that I only know because I looked it up is that I think a Dominion game lasts 19 turns. Big, for money, big money. Big money in a two player game will get their fifth province on either turn 18 or 19, I think. Yeah. Is okay. what it is. So that's your, that's your food baseline. Yeah. So divide the number of cards in your deck by five. That's how many turns it takes to get through your deck. So w while we're talking about Dominion, I, I want to bring up a very specific card. And this is what actually got me initially thinking about deck efficiency. There exists a card in the base set called Chancellor, and it's pretty much a terrible card in all senses of the word. Um, it costs three and gives you two money and allows you to put your deck into your discard pile. And that action in general is not super good. 
But while having that card in the game and like thinking about how I want, how I could use this card got me thinking a lot about deck efficiency and that action allows you to create efficiencies in your deck that you may not have had before. So like uh, in a general sense, like you can play that card to, and, and then uh, put your deck into your discard pile and whatever you buy this turn, which theor- theoretically should be better than your average, whatever your average deck is, will go into your deck and get reshuffled right away, as opposed to just sitting in your discard pile for a while. Yeah. And while, yeah, you're not trashing, the, like this card doesn't trash, and yes, the card's not good, it, it allows you to create this deck efficiency that you hadn't necessarily seen before. Yeah, th- that actually And it works, got me thinking about it. That actually works with other cards in Dominion too. There are certain situations in Dominion where the value of playing a card or not playing it is roughly the same, but playing it will cycle through your deck. So Yeah, like even that, just drawing drawing more cards at yeah, the end of a it, turn. And it feels bad to draw cards knowing that they're not going to benefit you. What if you already have enough money to buy the thing that you're going to buy that turn? It feels bad to draw more, more cards knowing that you're not going to, to use them. But what that does is it creates deck efficiency where you're effectively... Getting more accesses on your better cards. Yeah. 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 Oh, that, and I, it's even I hadn't more thought true. of that angle before. Some of That's these really newer games that, that don't let you go through your deck as often as in Dominion. Like, sure. Yeah. Isn't the game you got... Isn't Gloomhaven like that? Or am I totally yeah, off, yeah. off base? Well, Gloomhaven, you have to like trash a card each time through. Okay. And you only start out with about 10 cards. Yeah, Gloom- and you Gloom- only play two per turn. Well, Gloomhaven's a okay. little bit different. It's different because you have access to the whole deck every And you turn. don't have to go through the whole deck. Oh, okay. You're optimizing in different ways there. Yeah, yeah. An example, though, would be Mage Knight, where you're going through your deck six times total. So like if there was a card in Mage Knight that let you just all of a sudden put your deck in your discard pile and start from scratch. That would be awesome, right? Theoretically. Yeah, I mean, I, it, I don't, I've never it's different Mage in Mage Knight because so it would know. extend your turn. Like the length of your turn is once through your deck. Um, okay. But it's the reason why when you gain cards in Mage Knight, you put them on top of your deck. You don't put them in your discard pile. So there's, a, there's different calculations there where because the deck is kind of the timer for the game, oh, okay. you, you automatically get the good cards that you just purchased immediately. So maybe maybe that ex- illustrates how it doesn't apply to this example. Sure. But, yep. Yeah, but no, it, it's it's a great thing to think about. But ac- yeah, I guess access to actions, access to new things is is generally a good thing. So you might end up doing some action in a game that doesn't feel valuable in and of itself. But it opens up other things down the road. So that's something to to have in mind to combat that feeling of, I don't want to do this thing that, that doesn't seem to benefit me now. The next thing on my list is to figure out if the game wants you to be distinct from other players or to follow them. And this is a super interesting one because among Euro games in particular, there's a lot of variation there. I'd say most of the time, a rule of thumb that's good to follow is to do a different strategy than other players. But sometimes the game rewards you for kind of following along. There are some games where your actions are more efficient by other people doing the same actions, like Roll for the Galaxy. Yeah, that that was the first thing that came to mind. That produce and ship is by itself, if you're doing it kind of every other time, So you're selecting produce one turn and then ship the other turn is much less efficient than other strategies. If you kind of work with another player to make sure both of those things happen in a round, it suddenly becomes super efficient and super valuable. Lisboa has the same kind of thing. It has a lot of interactivity with other players where in some sense you want to do... In some things, you want to be different than other players, but in others, you want to be the same. So when you're building shops in Lisboa, they go on this grid, and every time someone builds on the grid, they take away a rubble cube, 
which reduces the cost of people building in that column or row in the future. Hmm. So in that sense, if someone starts leading off with shops, it can be valuable to follow them and then be the second person there and get effectively the same thing for, for less cost. Whereas in Castles of Burgundy, if you see that someone is going for a particular farm animal, you don't necessarily want to be fighting over that farm animal the whole game because you're not going to both be able to accomplish it. In an, unless it's a two-player game and you're trying to block them, you want to try to pick either a different strategy or go for a completely different animal just because you're fighting over the same scarce resource. And, concept, and going back to some of our other points, you're going to end up with more inefficient turns because you're competing over this one scarce thing. And if you can find a way to do something different, you can ramp up your efficiency engine faster and with less interruptions. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The main thing, I guess, is that you you don't want other people to be constantly blocking your engine or your, your right. efficiency you, you or want, production. It, in a two-player game, that's different, it's different usually because then it's, it's much more of a zero-sum. If I block you, I'm gaining that net effectively in a, a lot of cases but in three and four or more you want the other players to fight each other even if it's not even if it's if it's a war game more so but even if it's just a euro if they're competing over the same resources and you kind of have your own monopoly your economy is going to be better speaking of war games or like or, or direct conflict games another one i had on here is to not make it look like you're in the lead. And I think this applies more to direct conflict games, but it certainly applies to Euro games where you can have indirect blocking or something. And th this is kind of piggybacking off of the discussion Amber and I had a, a little while ago about her kind of psychological strategies in board games. And one of the things she does is try to appear not significant. <laughs> so to appear not as strong as she actually is. And I think you've been testing this out with games of Twilight Imperium and been using it to great effect, I think, of doing different things to make it seem like you're not necessarily winning when maybe you're in the best position. Yeah, it's really counterintuitive to me because the way I initially approach a game is I want to be as efficient as possible and score victory points faster than everyone else. But in a large multiplayer game with combat or blocking or things like that if everyone gangs up on you you're not going to beat all of them you you can't uh i mean they just have so many more resources and actions and ships and you know whatever the whatever it is they're going to just come down on you and knock you out of the game or put you far behind so if you can just creep along in second place third place and put all the attention on the first like Okay, Mario Kart, right? You don't want to be in first place until the very end because all the blue yeah. shells are going to hit you. <laughs> That's actually a great way to think of it. Yeah, yeah. And and I was reading, what was the book? Characteristics of Games, which is kind of like a textbook for, for board games, for board game design. And they were making the argument that any game with direct conflict like that is ultimately just a simple political game of convincing other people that you aren't winning and then blocking the person who is winning and then the winner ends up being the person who yeah. at Gets the very end the can jump ahead and they were kind of putting it as a criticism of those games or, or at least a challenge to those kinds of games which i think is somewhat true that you that ultimately the game can come down to that and that's where you get like kingmaker problems and the challenge for for lack of a better word an ameritrash game like that is overcoming that or at least obscuring that part of the game in something really thematic and interesting rather than kind of the reduction of it poking through i wonder how different euro games really are because the in the interaction is indirect but like i'm thinking of like concordia in the way you're manipulating points in that case and it, it's kind of the same thing well, I mean, that's where the argument comes in that basically all the games we see now are hybrids. Like, they have aspects yeah, of, of everything. Sure. So, and I think that's true. You, when you look at older Euro games, they tend to be more kind of, you know, multiplayer solitaire, where you don't have as much of an ability. Go ahead, Bubba. So, like, I, I think a lot of people do this 
without even knowing it sometimes. Like bringing it all the way back to Settlers again, because that, that's a, an easy example. Like towards the end of the game, you can sit in that game. You can sit on five victory points and be basically there. You can be one road away from taking longest road. You can be one night away from just playing a night and getting two free victory points. And all of a sudden you're at nine. And I I know people do that. Like that that's a, a very easy way to be like, hey, I'm only at five victory points. I'm no threat whatsoever. Don't block me. Don't put the robber on me. And I think that that's an example that everyone can relate to. It doesn't have to be just these big war games, but it happens in those too. Like you mm-hmm. see these, this flurry of victory points at the very end of war, most of like Twilight Imperium I'm thinking of this flurry of victory points in the last turn, someone scores three, four points and wins the game. And it's because they're sitting on them with actions basically in hand, ready to go, ready to give them points. Well, in the, in thinking of Catan, I haven't played it in a, couple years i think but when i did play it more back around college i remember becoming very fond of a strategy of really going after development cards hard because i found that you know because you could be sitting on like two or three points in face down cards and other people wouldn't know it and i i I liked using that to my advantage to appear to be in a lesser position and get better trades yeah it can give you a psychological advantage because you're perceived as not being a threat, and so you get more favorable treatment and better access to resources. The next thing on my list is specific to co-ops, and I think this is really understanding the structure of what I would call the traditional cooperative game. So in the in the line of pandemic, where you have you're working together, maybe it's you know, completely open cards, open every open information all around, and you're basically competing against the deck or the dice or the randomizing element. And that's the idea of not getting bogged down on net neutral actions. So maybe what I would call them are, are defensive actions, but instead trying to do that as little as possible and instead doing as much as you can actions that progress your victory condition so i think in pandemic the fundamental thing that people have trouble with is they're always trying to clear out cubes when the point of pandemic is ideally you want to clear as few cubes as possible while getting cures right you don't want to waste action on clearing cubes that you don't need to clear it's even more because you're not going to win the game by clearing cubes you're just preventing the loss And you want to kind of, the games are designed to be challenging in that they force you to kind of walk that line of not losing really closely if you want to do well. Does that make sense to you guys? Yeah, I I mean, I I think I kind of interrupted you for a second, but I I said it's even more the case in like Forbidden Desert where, and I think it's even more apparent in that game too, where you're going to lose if you go around just clearing sand the whole time. Yeah, right. the, the sand progression or the cube buildup in Pandemic outpaces your actions. It right. always will. Yeah, so so again, the idea is to try to do as little as you can on those defensive actions of preventing a loss condi- condition and then maximize the amount of time and action spent on progressing your win condition. It's almost a similar point to not getting caught up in building your engine indefinitely. Because in, bo- in both cases, you have to have your end, the end goal in mind. The game is something that begins and then ends. So don't get caught up in fighting fires that you can just let burn. And, and don't get caught up in, in building your engine past the point that it's useful. Yeah. And I, th- I think that's a good point because it's the same feeling. Like it, like you said before, it feels good to build this engine into infinity, and in pandemic, it feels good to completely cure a disease. Uh, I forget what the it, word is yeah. that they use. Or see, uh, eradicate. Or see. Eradicate. Yeah. That's what I was looking yeah, for. It feels, it feels great so when good. You have huge swaths of land with no cubes on it. <laughs> right, and you don't necessarily need to do that. Yeah. Exactly. That's everything I had. There are more things. A lot of them are specific to Netrunner because I've been playing Netrunner recently, but 
I'm not going to go into that. I know, Bubba, you had some ideas that I didn't have on my list. Why don't you talk about those? Most of them we covered. I have one left that we didn't necessarily get to. We talked before about, I think it was your fifth or sixth point, about figuring out if the game wants you to follow others or to be distinct. And one thing I wanted to add to that was, for me, when I start a game, especially like an action-oriented game, I will try to open a game with like an objectively powerful action. So something that will get you off on the right foot. But from then on, you got to leave your options open and you have to be willing to adapt and be flexible. So specifically to this point where if you want to follow others or be distinct, you're not going to ever win a game if you just sit there and follow another person's strategy turn for turn. And Orion said that earlier, but you need to be able to to twist and turn and be creative like games and playing these games are for the most part inherently very creative and that's honestly why i play board games i love the creative thinking and the molding and melding of the two concepts of creative thinking and like this engineering type thinking of mathing it out uh, and putting those two together it's probably why like Orion is a computer programmer. That's the same type of thinking there. You have to be creative and have this statistical type thinking. I don't know. It's just something I wanted to mention. There's a point there in that it's very difficult to value, to evaluate flexibility or leaving options open in a game. And so I think I tend to kind of lock myself into strategies and don't value flexibility a lot. Do you think you're a bit different than that? You tend to value have leaving options open more in games? Absolutely. Especially in any games where you can get blocked. So mm -hmm. Agricola comes to mind. Like if you're dead set on a specific strategy... There are turns in that game, and, the, and this is why this Agricola is considered so brutal. Like, if you're that type of person where you have this strategy and you're thinking in this one line, and all of a sudden someone takes that action, you're going to get thrown for a loop. I find it more beneficial to just basically keep an open mind and keep every turn reevaluating re your strategy. And yes, we get... When you're doing that, we get your your Matthew Geesmans of the world that will uh, st sit there and stare at the table for <laughs> eons and eons. But there there He's is something a to lot be said better. for that. <laughs> well, <laughs> I I find this incredibly interesting for for people who don't know you, Bubba, are pretty well known for being quite good at games. I remember in college we would and still do re repeat the mantra that Bubba always wins and. My thinking is that generally in, in most games, if you're valuing flexibility, you're sacrificing some amount of efficiency. And so I always try to kind of walk the line a bit and, and try to maximize efficiency. But I, I find it so fascinating that maybe I'm completely undervaluing flexibility, particularly in certain games to where, you know, the efficiency gains just aren't worth it if you can get set back so easily. Flexibility is way more important than efficiency, especially when you're playing with people like Orion. Because I will never be as efficient as some of the people at this table right now. But if I am flexible, I have the moment of opportunity. Surprise, Amber. <laughs> didn't see that coming. I literally didn't. She just snuck up on me. And that's so correct, Amber. I actually just listened to yours and Mark's podcast that you did. I guess it was probably two months ago now, but I just listened to it probably two weeks ago. And I, when I first started the podcast, I'm like, okay, I'm just, I'm going to like be on board with Mark. I'm not going to relate to Amber at, almost at all. And for the most part, that was true. But there were definitely things in there that I'm like, huh? Yeah, no, Am Amber's got this right. Like, and, and one of them is just the ability to change course at any given point in a game and reevaluate the game state. And that's so important in so many games. 
And this is actually something I didn't write down, but know where you at are. In some games, it's like it's Say that obvious. Again? Like in uh, know where you are in the game. So, and I'm not talking about timing. I'm talking about where you are on the leaderboard. So, like in Dominion, you should know if you have three provinces in your deck or two. And yeah, in Dominion, it's a little easier to do. Some games, it's harder though. But know exactly how many points you will need or or what condition it is you will need to actually win the game. Well, and that kind of ties into the strategy tip that I've repeated a few times throughout the podcasts that I forgot to write down, even though this one's been, I burned it into my brain, is that when you're behind in a game, you need to take more risks, basically. You need to take more variable strategies, assuming your goal is to win and not, like, score the most points, you know. But in most games, you're trying to be number one. You're not trying to necessarily be number Yeah, not be four. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And in those cases, if you're ahead, you generally want to play more conservatively. And if you're behind, you want to take more risks. I will say that I've often had the experience because I enjoy theory crafting and thinking about what would be a cool strategy in this game. And I wonder if I could pull that off. And I'll go into a game being like, I'm going to try blue cards this time in Viticulture. And then my competitive streak will come out and I'll get to a point where someone else has taken blue cards and i'm like well it's not worth it for me going i'm gonna go do this other thing that is more efficient and is more likely for me to win the game and i make that choice over and over and over and it's it's just an interesting kind of situation i keep putting myself in because i enjoy theory crafting but when you get into the game you have to be able to pivot to a better strategy i find it interesting in how many of these general strategy tips there, there's something that doesn't feel right when you play it. Like, it doesn't feel right to not continue to build your engine. In this in this last one, it doesn't feel right to not go for the most optimal, efficient thing. So I get frustrated. There, there's an element of getting frustrated when I can't go for the most efficient thing, even though it's not the, the best play. You know, it... If I can, I'm thinking of Scythe. If I can plan out four turns where I get exactly what I need and I make this and that lets me make that and I do this and it's like the perfect four turns, like in reality, that's going to happen one out of 10 times because something else is going to go wrong. Someone else is going to block me. So it feels like a compromise when I, I go for the more flexible thing that is going to be gonna leave my options open that's 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 interesting because i don't feel if i have to do that i don't necessarily feel that i'm compromised i just kind of have to change my perspective and then maybe become slightly more combative with other people or yeah it's interesting because yeah i i don't think that i have a problem doing it i think i it just makes you uncomfortable it, it feels bad in the same way that sacrificing my engine because i know that I don't need to keep building the engine to win the game. It feels bad in that way. I'm listening to this and I am just thinking, this is why I can win. (laughs) Well, well that comes back to loss aversion. And this is something Jeff Engelstein talks about that people hate losing something they have that when you, you run psychological studies that people dislike losing $10 roughly. I think it's like, two and a half times more than they enjoy gaining ten dollars and a big example of this is apparently in like second edition D D, there was a, a monster that would literally eat your levels and people despised it even though like you could make a monster that like cripples you or like chops your arm off or something like that but if you lose something that you've worked towards like gaining a level People just absolutely despise it. So often, and again, I'm thinking of Netrunner because I've been playing it online a lot. You can utilize people's aversion to losing something to your advantage and then kind of cheat ahead to a, you know, to a better play. I mean, even just keeping the other player on their their heels in that net zero action uh, that we described earlier. You know, you can you can use that to your advantage where they might be better off just letting you take their thing so that they can 
come around and for a greater gain taking your thing if you can keep them in that defensive stance Mm -hmm. this reminds me of the uh one guy we played twilight imperium with last weekend that annexed a planet like across the galaxy for free with this random like this racial ability he had and then for the rest of the game he just threw all of his fleets and forces and cards and his sole purpose was to regain this his planet as he repeatedly called it even though it was clearly in another person's like (laughs) slice of the galaxy and he had not lost anything from gaining it and he had like annexed it for free but he's like no that's my planet i have to take it back yeah, that was really funny. It was yeah, so actually. funny to watch. It was clear to everyone else at the table that he had no claim of ownership to this planet. <laughs> and he was losing way more by trying to get it back than by doing something else. Any any other points? I was going to talk about tempo as a concept, but I think I want to save that for maybe a later podcast or a later article. I find I find the concept of tempo incredibly fascinating, but that might be a bit beyond this. It Are, seems that when we come into a podcast thinking we'll have nothing to say, we just go on for hours. Yeah, and I think it ends up being a great podcast. <laughs> it's great. I, Embrace the lack of planning. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, I had eight bullet points here. That's that's good for me. I actually have two more things. One is um, something I've been thinking a lot about in relation to analytics in football, in that this idea of I'm going to try to boil this down and say that innovation and a competitive edge often comes by subverting the common wisdom or the, you know, like the understood best strategy. And if you can find creative ways to subvert that or to change assumptions or to find value a, things differently. Find a market inefficiency. Exactly. You'll, you're going to gain an edge in certain ways and you can utilize that to win. Um, and a great example of this is in the Super Bowl, the Eagles coach, Doug Peterson, went for it on fourth down like three times where the conservative wisdom is, nope, you got to punt if you're not in field goal position. But they had analytics people up in the booth running the numbers and said, no, it's we gain more expected points by going for it in this situation than by punting it away. And some of that is because you're playing against the greatest quarterback of all time. But also, mathematically, it's a better move in that situation to be aggressive, even though the con- the common wisdom is to play defensive. Yeah, and, and the cool thing with sports, and we talked about this in that bonus podcast about hockey, is that there's there's multiple games being played there because it's not just the game of who's going to win the football game. It's the game of the coach trying to prove himself to the owner and the media and the owner trying to prove themselves to the fans so that they can sell tickets. There's a lot of other games being played there that compromise the game of winning the football game yeah. in that situation. And those, those other side games, the market games that are being played with, you know, the salespeople or whatever are the reason why football teams often pursue suboptimal strategies. And happens to- in hockey too. To apply that, happens in every sport. To apply that sort of thinking to board gaming, back when we used to play resistance all the time, I got to a point where I was trying to find ways to subvert. We can kind of built up a accepted meta of if you're the spy in this situation, the correct play is to do this, and I would try to find situations where I could do the opposite, and where can I do the opposite and gain an advantage because it's unexpected. And there's some places where it's just obviously wrong, and there's a reason that that common wisdom or accepted wisdom is accepted. But I think in probably every field, you'll be able to find a spot where people have overlooked something and chosen the easy way instead of the hard way, or the the straightforward way instead of the complicated way. And if you choose that other path or to subvert that approach or mindset, you will gain an edge and be better or win or whatever in that given field it comes yeah. back to creativity exactly, That's exactly yeah. right like seeing those sorts of opportunities is one of the things that makes you better at winning board games 
Yeah, and, it, and in the context of board games, it can, it can also have a psychological effect on your opponent, especially, I think, in two-player games, where I'm thinking of... A while ago, I was watching a lot of chess videos, and there's a super famous game, super famous American chess player from the... Bobby s- Fischer? Bobby Fischer. He, there was a particular game where he had a really, really clever queen sacrifice. It has... The game is super famous but anyway it was it was the result of some really unexpected play to lead up to that queen sacrifice at least according to the guy who was talking about it and the theory was that because of his unorthodox play leading up to that point the opponent really was so confused or or bothered by the moves that happened prior that he didn't quite understand the impact of the actual queen sacrifice by the time that came and ended up making a big blunder that locked it in. Yes. Yeah, so and then like, I'm thinking in the very short history of Netrunner where you have a complete revolution kind of early on in, in the meta of Netrunner where people started understanding the, the idea of using damage in Jinteki to as as an as a way of not necessarily sealing the game let me let me explain a bit in netrunner in netrunner your health is your hand of cards and so if the corporation can do enough damage in their various cards that apply damage to wipe out the runner's hand and then do at least one additional damage the corporation wins the game and in the early days of netrunner the idea was that damage really was mostly valuable to win the game as a win condition until there was a guy i can't remember his name but from this area who really worked a lot on a strategy where he just applies a lot of damage in very small amounts over time as an efficiency play not necessarily as a game winning play because the threat of damage causes the runner to then have to draw more cards and spend actions drawing cards and it's since I think it, that strategy kind of, if I remember correctly from reading about it, that strategy worked for a long while because people didn't understand how to respond to it. And it was just something that was so kind of new and novel that they were able to gain a lot of psychological advantage playing that deck. Yeah, I think this is something that Amber would probably use of being unpredictable can force your opponents into bad moves. And so doing something that isn't the you know, game theory optimal play can sometimes be a more winning play because your opponent has to react to it. Yeah, absolutely. One final thing, and we've kind of touched on this in different situations, but the like my number one tip in like learning games or being better at games is to when you're when you're sitting down and looking at the game, figure out what you need to do to win. How do you actually get victory points? The best example of this is Twilight Imperium because it's so fun to build up a fleet or in the Euro games, it's so fun to build your engine. But the goal in most of these games is to score so many victory points either after so many rounds or to get to some threshold first. And so if you focus on how do I get victory points and then build your strategy around that as the number one goal, you will win more often than if you try to build the sexiest engine. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a reverse engineering almost. You say, I get victory points by doing this, and you work backwards on how to accomplish that. So I think that's why I kind of have this loops or order of operation approach, because I start with the end in mind of, I'm trying to get to this, and there'll be like mid-tier goals and the ultimate goal. But I'd be like, if I I need I want to do this, so I need to do these three things first. And I want to get, you know, I want to buy provinces in Dominion. So I need a way of getting money. Well, let me look at the cards and figure out a way of getting money. Well, and, and going back again to two-player games, there's the old mantra that it's only the... I've heard in the context of Magic that it's only the 20th point of damage that matters, right? Or a Netrunner, it's only the 7th point that matters, and the idea being that it doesn't matter how well you're playing to get up to the threshold to winning. It's a matter of actually getting past that threshold to winning that matters. So you have to you have to play so that you actually reach the victory point threshold, not 
so that you seem to be doing very well, but ultimately fall short of it. So I'm, I'm looking at the box of War of the Ring right now, where I know as the free peoples, it's, it's sometimes very tempting to kind of tempt both victory conditions, either destroying the ring in Mount Doom or trying to achieve a military victory. But it doesn't matter how if you get close to both of those. It only matters if you actually accomplish one of them. And I think I felt in the past that I've made an error of doing well at getting close on both of them, but not actually succeeding in the win. I guess that's an entire, entirely separate point from what you're saying, but it came to mind. Well, that's our podcast for today. I think that was a really interesting discussion. It opened my eyes even to some things I hadn't thought of before. And I hope it helps you out with getting better at the board games you play. Maybe you'll surprise some people in your game group now uh, with some unexpected wins. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to rate and with review. Some bizarre losses. <laughs> with some bizarre losses. <laughs> There you go. Or, Either or win some, or lose really weirdly. <laughs> or some analysis paralysis. That too. Oh, try, to, try to avoid that one. <laughs> Make sure to rate and review this podcast on iTunes. Check out the written stuff at thethoughtfulgamer.com. I'm going to have... Oh, wait. I'm thinking of, of right now. There will be a really cool review of Lisboa that's already been up by the time this podcast is published and that's an exciting game check me out on social media on twitter on facebook and if you do enjoy this podcast and want to watch it live or if you just want to support us uh, we're almost to our goal of basically breaking even for 2018 expenses go to patreon.com slash the thoughtful gamer and i greatly appreciate any support you can give there we'll talk to you again soon goodbye peace out adios (laughs) 